Hi there. Thanks for joining me on Rethink Real Estate for Good. I'm Eve Picker, and I'm on a mission to make real estate work for everyone. I love real estate. Real estate makes places good or bad, rich or poor, beautiful or not. In this show, I'm interviewing the disruptors, those creative thinkers and doers that are shrugging off the status quo in order to build better for everyone. If you haven't already, check out all of my podcasts at our website, rethinkrealestateforgood.co, or you can find them at your favorite podcast station. You'll find lots worth listening to, I'm sure. Stephanie Blake is an historian at heart. That's what she studied at Yale, much to her parents' dismay. They didn't understand how she could leverage history into a career, but she has in a big way. Stephanie leads a company that revels in enormously gorgeous and gritty vacant buildings, the sort of buildings that most people can't reimagine to have any useful life today. 19th century post offices, millions of square feet of vacant commercial space and empty industrial buildings that all have a story to tell. Skylight Studios finds good use for those spaces, turning them into a branding campaign for their next act. What began as a small business creating temporary pop-ups in unused spaces has become a very big one with a non-traditional portfolio of venues where temporary can mean a decade. For Stephanie, there is always a story that will pave the way from old to new. You'll want to hear more. If you'd like to join me in my quest to rethink real estate, there are two simple things you can do. Share this podcast and go to rethinkrealestateforgood.co where you can subscribe to be the first to hear about my podcasts, blog posts, and other goodies. Hi, Stephanie. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. So you run a really fascinating and innovative company um, known for creating intentional short-term real estate opportunities. Do you want to tell us what Skylight Studios is all about? Yeah, um, you know, Skylight Studios, we consider ourselves to be a creative placemaking and non-traditional venue development and management firm. And I think the two businesses are really linked because about a decade ago, we started really longer now um, during the 2008 recession to sort of identify creative use for underutilized buildings. And I think by bringing in really interesting events and experiences with some of the most creative brands at the time, organically, we created a sense of place and identity for these buildings that jump started development, investment. And we've seen that only continue in terms of the way the built environment just can't keep up with how human behavior and these sort of cycles of- And, and uh, viruses, right? <laughs> viruses, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. How does it work? How does the business work? We were founded in New York City specifically because in sort of an urban environment, and back in 2008, there were so many incredible buildings that were sort of either historic or, or and purpose built that didn't have a use in sort of at that time. And so we really focused on adaptive reuse and looking at buildings and seeing why, are, you know, why are they vacant? How are they so underutilized? And how do we partner with the owners of those buildings to both generate revenue, but also create activity that enhances the community and provide the canvas for potential future tenants. So I think that's really mainly, it's, it's a function of partnerships with the owners of buildings, often historic and underutilized buildings and Skylight having a vision around, you know, what makes the bones of a creative canvas. And then, you know, throughout the years, we've seen, you know, starting back in 2008 with fashion being sort of at its 
height in, in New York, um, seeing some of the creatives like a Ralph Lauren or, you know, a Chanel or any of these guys who are setting the tone for interesting experiences who also appreciated um, history and architecture and something that others might see as just a dilapidated warehouse and celebrating that and putting investment against these ephemeral experiences. And from that, they would set the tone and media and tech would follow and, and they would want to also create experiences. So from that, we feel like we've created this sort of luxury shared economy where for a building that is interesting um, and an interesting canvas, you can achieve market rent or greater by putting together the best of industries in an environment that isn't set up for you know, necessarily even having all the power in the restrooms and um, the things you would imagine you need in a traditional venue. So how big are the buildings or the spaces that you, you tackle? Is there any typical? Yeah, you know, I think for us, uh, we do look at larger spaces, but I think it's not a typical venue because we'll do it in parks. You know, the High Line was an amazing project for us, you know, working on still today with Four Freedoms Park, the Louis Kahn design park on Roosevelt Island. You know, it's really about, we, we often talk about the third place. So yes, it usually is, you know, 10,000 square feet or greater, just because the types of events and the creativity and the experience of a space for us be it for filming content or events, does require a bit of scale. We are looking for high ceiling heights, which is the interesting part about when we say adaptive reuse, these purpose-built buildings, whether it's power plants or warehouses or post offices or printing presses, they're meant for production and the ceiling height and the materials used allow for both a sense of strength and a soulfulness, but also just purely from production. If you're doing something in a temporary way, you want to create an incredible experience and it helps to have scale to do that. Let me back up a bit. So these are short-term events and do you pick spaces and find partners to activate them with, or do you find spaces and talk to the landlords about the potential or do people with vacant buildings come to you or all of the above? Yeah, it's all of the above. For us, while our events are short term, our engagement is not short term, even if it might be an interim use. Often it might be five years, seven years. It's a lot of these projects that are stalled and looking to be jump started through creative activation and revenue and to gain interest. So Moynihan Station is a great example of that. Thinking about the middle of New York City and Midtown, uh, the post office that was the sister building to the original Penn Station was vacant for, you know, 30 years and counting, a significant portion, you know, probably 10% of it was still an active post office. There were leaks in the ceiling, there were cobwebs and pigeons, you know, all over this building and it's 2 million square feet that's just vacant. Wow. And you needed $10 million to even begin to make it into something that a standard tenant would take on. The carrying costs were significant. And we walked in and we lit up and it was the skylights and the nature of this sort of black resin floor where 80% of the mail would come across from Europe and it was black so that you could see the mail that would fall on the floor. And you had these catwalks before there were security systems where people would sit up in these catwalks in this you know, 60 foot ceiling and look and watch people sorting the mail to make sure that no one was feeling anything and it was being done the way that was expected. And to have that and recognize the creatives we work with, you know, we moved New York Fashion Week from Lincoln Center there because, you know, the designers that want to create these experiences that feel otherworldly, they really appreciate the history and also the nature of, of what that building was. Buildings aren't built that way anymore. And so for us, you know, we came in, we created, you know, a short term event venue, but it was over the course of five years and, and counting. And to this day, they credit, you know, Skylight moving New York Fashion Week, bringing through the Anna Wintours, doing things with, you know, Hermes and the Whitney Museum and, you know, Edible Schoolyard and all of these things to sort of bring an audience and exposure. And also, you know, we generated over $17 mm -hmm. million 
And so for Vernado and Related to then come in and, and see the investment and for them to restore the skylights in a way that originally they thought they were going to just rebuild, it was just a very interesting arc to then also, as Vernado is doing this $3 billion redevelopment, Skylight has come back in, you know, Vernado tapped us to think about how can we continue now that they actually have redeveloped and are, are launching, we have two venues that will be operating and we're also the partner to think about interesting programming to help keep that redevelopment vibrant and the future of work and sort of what that can be to Midtown requires more than just the materials and an incredible architect to design spaces. You need that heartbeat of what actually keeps these spaces active and interesting and engaging. Mm -hmm. It sounds like your role role has unexpectedly become a um, historic renovation advocate as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that term. You know, we often consider what we do to be urban archaeology because I think we're we're sort mm -hmm. of seeing these buildings, understanding how they were built. The how incredible the bones are and the stories of why and how they were built and, and what they meant to the city and bringing them back, you know, into today's context. And it's very fascinating. Yeah, I think we have a real, a deep appreciation for history. It sounds like it. So just run through for me, what, what type of vacant spaces do you tackle? Like how big is the range? Yeah, it ranges from, you know, 10,000 square feet to millions of square feet. I think at this point, um, you know, we have a 32 acre district that we work with in downtown LA. Um, obviously the post office, Moynihan was 2 million square feet and counting. Thinking about some of the parks that we're brought into. I, I think that, you know, we're, we're working with Ford on the sort of revitalization of Michigan Central in Detroit. I think that a lot of these projects, I think what I was starting to say earlier around the third place, you know, especially coming out of COVID, we're very aware of the first place being your home, the second place being where you go to work. And these third places are not defined for us as, as a culture, or as a society. And I think they can be parks, they could be libraries, maybe once upon a time they were the mall. And I think it fuses sort of entertainment with community and art and culture and music and the different things that bring us together. And I think more than ever, a lot of developers, landlords, cities are focused on how do you make sense of this third place? What does that mean for vacant retail, for the future of malls, for even the way people are questioning office and how and why and when we come together. And so I think a lot of what Skylight looks at and the reason I think our spaces have gotten bigger and even more interesting is because it is. What, what is the third place? When you have a district, how do you think about the negative space, the walkways, the common areas, the outdoor environment that might be the quad between your retail? Or uh, So I think we like to think of what we do as not just being confined to a specific building or 10,000 square feet, but truly how do we think about the sort of master operations of a district or a neighborhood? And how do we connect the public space to the private space to the retailers to the F and B in a way that can be fused through intentional programming and experiences. So you really are urban design strategists. That's really what it sounds like. How do you interconnect everything in the environment? I think we work with a lot of experts in different fields, and whether they are urban planners or economists or the bid or the economic development corporation, you know, or architects. And I, I think a lot of these experts help inform our activation strategy where we see so much value in bringing expertise to the table. But ultimately, I think what we've organically evolved into is, to your point, sort of these urban planning sort of activators, if you will, because I think that as we've seen between technology, these viruses, all the things in which, you know, has just sort of sped up the world and how we interact and our expectation of space and environment, the built world just can't keep up. And so a lot of the experts and a lot of the things that are static and built can't keep up. And so I do think our role is to think about how everything from in real estate, where everything has been about these traditional asset classes and these types of uses, and then when you think about on the flip side, um, the idea of urban planning and, you know, it's meant to be built in a sustainable way and last for decades. 
but our behavior is changing quickly. So I think it's Skylight's role to interpret and take in that information and allow for a program that helps adapt and change. And that, that really is events and experiences in a way that, you know, maybe even five years or 10 years ago, events were seen as a very superficial thing. But now I think it's truly a fundamental part of our society and, and the development of, of the built environment. So the big question I have is, is does the ultimate post event goal differ for your clients or you? I mean, do you have different end goals in mind? I think we do, but I think ultimately there is this concept of all ships rise with the rising tide and the idea of even, you know, there is a disconnect between a landlord's goals and the retailer who or the tenant who's filling their space. But if you're choosing to be in a space because of the neighborhood, because of the architecture, because of the design, because of the demographic that's there, it works. And, and I think we've seen more and more a lot of brands and activations be a way that creates community. Uh, the goal for, you know, product-driven brands is to create loyalty from their customers. And I think, honestly, a big part of Skylight has been finding that common ground between the city officials planning, the police department, the fire department, the landlord, and the brands. And I think there's common ground to be found because when you create a great experience, it helps everyone. And I think there's a pressure on brands more than ever to have a, a mission to do good in the world. And I think that falls very nicely in line with generating community and thinking about a neighborhood and that the experience is not just, you know, slapping up your logo and showing your new shoes. It's the story. And that's the stuff that resonates with people and humanity generally. And I think the storytelling through events is something that you can find the right thread and it can be very powerful to identify that common ground in terms of how are you playing a role in revitalizing this neighborhood and establishing community and where does your brand story fit into that? So do you think your model can help to rescue the central business district, which is facing an existential crisis right now? Like we're thinking about entire places, not just buildings, right? That are looking pretty vacant um, and have to really think about how to reinvent themselves. Yes, I do think it's a big challenge and I think it's very dependent on the buildings and the way a central business district might be set up. For us, we've had interesting experiences in Chicago with the Board of Trade building, having these trading floors that are 30, 40 foot ceilings, 30,000 square feet. And when you have that, you know, we could do interesting things, not just trying to repurpose, you know, 10 foot ceiling height, right. old 80s offices. I think there's different ways to think about Skylight being a catalyst for what is the future of some of this vacant office space and how do you still draw people to it? And if there isn't the triple net 10-year lease, how do you think about why companies are bringing people together and can you create spaces that can be shared and still draw people to that space, which then allows for the other businesses that exist, be it, you know, the uh, the cobbler or the sweet greens or whoever needs to be patronized by the office workers. So I think there's some ways we've thought about that. And depending on, you know, the physical bones of the buildings in that area, I think we can play a role in that. I think it's different than the plight of retail and malls, but I think there's some similarities there where I think just the expectation and the use of physical space is changing. And I think there's been an understanding for a very long time that it is traditional. It's one use, it's a restaurant, it's an office space, it's, you know, a brick and mortar store that just sells what's coming out of its inventory there. And I think the world is changing. And I think entertainment experience work, all of that in combination with content creation and the digital footprint against the physical is an important formula for central business districts because I think there's an inherent challenge. I don't think they can stay static and just be revitalized with the existing mix of types of businesses, particularly for some of the less interesting central business districts where they don't have 
you know, a, a historic, like beautiful building or they don't have the bones. They're very sort of built for what, what was meant to be there, which is, you know, you have your cubicles, you have your office, you have, you know, the smaller retail down below. And, and I think with that, it's taking a more holistic view. I think that's also a big thing we've seen that can be a factor is how do the landlords come together? Like what's the role of the bid or does a landlord come in and swoop up a significant portion of real estate so that they have a more cohesive approach to the tenanting, to the community, to what's happening there? I think we've seen that be a, a pretty big factor in where even, even where Skylight can make a difference or not. You were involved in the remaking of Bleecker Street, which um, sounds really interesting because I think there were financial aspects how that street came back that also play a really big role so that that was a, a five blocks right a five block street that yeah. was in pretty bad shape what happened there to bring it back yeah i think that's a great jumping off point because it was brookfield coming in and purchasing a number of those storefronts and providing that sort of overarching opportunity to not just have one storefront but multiple you know across these few blocks and I think Bleecker Street was always, in terms of the corridor and, and the West Village and having this sort of sense of it being a charming place where you have discovery and surprise and delight, as mm -hmm. it became more successful and landlords saw they could increase rents and they could take the stores that could pay top dollar on Fifth Avenue and put them there, you know, the, the community and the neighborhood it, it was disconnected with its identity no more surprise and delight right <laughs> no more surprise and delight exactly and so i think you know as vacancy increased and you know it was recognized that these stores even the big box you know the one the ones that were you know very well resourced it didn't make sense for them to stay open it made more sense for them to even hang on to their lease, but not to staff it, which is a crazy challenge. And so I think Brookfield really saw an opportunity as placemakers and, and part of that sort of ethos to shift that and, and take a chance. And so I think by taking, you know, five storefronts and working with a, a firm like us, it was very much to think about not just filling the stores, but also how do we create sort of a, a sense of community and programming on that street to bring back the legacy of, of what Bleecker was to the beatnik poets, to the days of Kerouac, to the music, to all of those pieces and, and think about also what is the future of, of retail and how do you take some of these, you know, digitally native brands and give them an opportunity. You know, for Skylight, I think we were very thoughtful around even thinking about mentorship. So the, the stores that had survived and that were there, why did they survive and how can you create a community and, and a platform between these digitally native brands and those that had been there that were really based in brick and mortar and have connectivity. And it was successful in that it became self-sustaining. So once we connected these different brands with one another, and I think that's where the special sort of uh, connection happened was, was just not only did you need to be thoughtful about who you were trying to place there, but also how did they jive with the existing stores there? And how do you create a program for programming and experiences and activation that allowed these brands and companies to get a jump start in terms of seeing how programming on a street and doing things together can actually drive traffic and sales. And then once the Skylight, once we set that program, they got it and they were able to continue that level of programming to today. And I think that's been a huge success for them. It sounds like a really interesting model that might be used in other places. You know, as we see a lot of vacancies in, in retail strip districts, um, main streets. Yeah, I think it's definitely the West Village is a really, you know, we had a lot to work with. I, I think when you think about some of the other districts, I do think community and a platform that really creates a shared sense of responsibility and also a shared customer or a shared approach because I, I think that there does need to be some structure even though everything can and, and will and should be hyper localized I do think there's a formula around how to give tools and resources to these sort of retail districts and help them move into a, a space where they can meet the consumers the way that the landscape's changing. So what about 
big tech. Have you worked with big tech at all? And what are they trying to accomplish? <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, we have worked with all of the big tech. And I think it's really interesting to see their emphasis on short-term experiences and being able to sort of experiment and build on proof of concept. I think similarly to how we were just speaking about the built environment not keeping up, I think big tech is aware of, you know, a lot of what they're doing digitally and in the cloud. Um, but I think ultimately they recognize that we're human beings with bodies and need mm -hmm. to also come together around what big tech is doing. And, and I think, you know, whether it's Netflix, right, you know, they are a content platform. Um, at the same time, I think the number of experiences that they've launched in person um, shows the value that they see in creating loyalty and experiences around their shows and connecting fans with one another through physical experiences. I think similarly in the work we've done with Meta and with Google and Amazon um, events, foster these moments that are memorable that I think as humans nothing can be replaced with what you experience online with what you might experience in person and so I think creating a level of engagement and identity I think big tech is really aware of the importance of events and experiences and the in-person value against the platforms that they've created in the digital space. Is there any backlash to brand bankrolled community space and, and how do you engage a community that's already there? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think that, you know, ultimately as I've seen, you know, even sitting in my small city that I, I live in now, I, I sit on this advisory committee to city council on setting the general plan for the next 20 years and cities and politics, it's very, very slow and hard to get things done. I think the beauty of some of these bigger brands with the right intentions is that they can be these 21st century patrons of community, of the arts, of these spaces. I think there's a lot of ways that Skylab has structured things to allow for the sort of VIP, the product launch, but then also community programming and educational programs that come from that. And I think there can be the same level of investment that gets amortized over the course of a couple of weeks where initially there is this, you know, big experience that is for their top clientele or for, you know, the creators that are part of their network and, and all of that. And then to think about that same build and that same experience and how to translate it. Um, I think there's also a lot of ways that we look at a full calendar year or five years of a project where these brands come in and, and they are the ones paying and subsidizing for the community driven programs. So if you're thinking of, you know, a lot of our model of Skylight is this sort of lower frequency, high caliber, where you have, you know, maybe 25, 30% of the calendar year filled with the stuff that provides that revenue stream and also provides the investment to then work with the community. And I do think that, you know, there is this focus on it's an overused authenticity or honesty around what you're doing as a brand and as a developer. And there's so much more of a spotlight, even from the community to have a voice and, and what that looks like. And so I do think generally, yes, gentrification is not going to go at any time you're redeveloping, you're doing something. But I do think there's a way to be really thoughtful around the brands, what they're doing, how those dollars get reinvested in creating a place for the community and continuing to work with the existing organizations that have been a part of that community, the artists, the various nonprofits that have played a role in, you know, whether it's education, the schools, all of that to integrate in a calendar that does feel like it's addressing all of the different parts of a community. A little authenticity. <laughs> so what's your story? I mean, how did you get from Yale to here? <laughs> um, you know, I, I was a history major, um, and I think oh, I've always well, had an appreciation. What? Yeah. I said, well, that, that fits the history major. <laughs> yeah. 
It does fit. And it's so interesting because I could have never predicted from being a history major at a liberal arts school that this would become sort of my my path. But I did. And my parents, actually, they are, um, you know, they grew up in Jamaica. They're immigrants who sort of, you know, really self-made, but felt really strongly that history was not <laughs> a super useful <laughs> degree. And when I was graduating, and I was offered a job at Google. You know, that was a great opportunity, even though I didn't understand. I mean, Google explained that they don't hire people that necessarily have a tech background or know what to do in this, you know, in sort of their framework, but they just want smart people who can think. But I think my parents were very surprised and excited that that was a transition from history major. And I think being at Google, it was an incredible environment to learn a lot um, and to understand the tools that are being used in the sort of digital space and, you know, sort of the software and the um, sort of in, for me, it felt so intangible, um, but to understand how this platform was created around something that I couldn't touch, see, feel, or really understand. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I struggled with that, even though I was really grateful and excited to be part of something at a time, you know, this was 2005, um, where it was changing rapidly, and it did feel like it was truly this pioneering thing that was changing the world, and being around other people who were so smart and innovative but I think I always knew that being in a physical space design how the built environment really affects your mood it affects how you connect with people it's just end of the day I just I feel so much that we're physical beings and, and the built environment is is a really important piece of how we see the world and how we connect with one another and so it was just an interesting opportunity that um a good friend of mine who was at Google said hey you know, I met this woman who's doing this interesting thing in this warehouse and we were going to do something there for YouTube. So at the time, uh, YouTube had just become a part of Google and I met with them and one thing led to another and I helped, um, you know, think about how space and the creative nature of a lot of these companies building things in the cloud and how that revenue stream can really help with the revitalization. And, and I think that you know, at the time, it really wasn't more than thinking about vacant space and creative experiences and having a revenue stream that could, you know, help float these spaces in the interim, keep pay for, you know, offset the costs of just the carrying costs. Um, and, and I think it really evolved into understanding the power of these types of experiences, the way that these big companies thought differently about short and long term investment in space and, and the value of that mm -hmm. again saturation of, of the digital space. It's interesting. And I think today it's interesting to see them the way that I can see real estate almost as in my head, it's very bizarre, but I do see it almost as like the search function of, you know, you have your ads on Google and, you know, they enable the search platform. I think there's a lot of controversy of how much can you tell between ads and the actual search results these days. But I do think there's a lot of value in thinking about to your question earlier how these big companies and brands um, can affect the quality of the built environment and how they can help fund that shift. And I don't think that the traditional model of just the landlord tenant relationship across all of these spaces um, where they are purpose built for one tenant and one use is the future. And so I think it's been interesting to apply some of the ways that I think being at Google in those sort of early days of my career and seeing how they were thinking so differently about this sort of space in the cloud could be applied to the built environment. So I'd love to know what services you don't provide yet that you're thinking about, or you know how you'd like to grow this company because it seems like you must be getting bigger pretty quickly. What are you thinking about? Where else can this go? Yeah, I think the primary use of our portfolio these days is twofold. It's really offering location-based, interesting environments for film and content. And that's often sort of the easiest way to go into, you know, we have this 800-acre active steel manufacturing plant off of Lake Ontario, or the power plant sitting on the Pacific Ocean in Redondo Beach. And that's something that I feel with the amount of dollars and the craze around the white hot market that is studio, there's still a significant amount of content and film that's done outside of the studio. And so I think identifying these really amazing 
assets for as film and content locations is something that I think could grow very quickly for us, especially because you can repurpose the workforce. The workforce that was part of this steel manufacturing plant can be you know, the workforce to make this a content environment. And so I think that's been really interesting and I think offers up a lot of different environments across the world for, for Skylit to go into. And I think additionally, thinking about this place and, and Skylight being the, the operator of the third place, I think there are so many amazing historic buildings and spaces, museums included, who are starting to struggle to come into their identity as the world's changing and technology is changing and all the immersive experiences are all of the sort of trend and how can Skylight identify how to increase revenue streams and direct dollars given that a lot of the biggest brands spending the most money on these creative experiences trust our vision and so in my ideal world you know we would look to identify existing businesses even that we can help amplify and add to not just these sort of underutilized buildings and I think that's a huge opportunity for expansion for us is to take some of the trends where we see whether it's Netflix or Google or these companies creating experiences how could we layer them into existing business models and existing uses like museums in a way that museums have been so thoughtful and evolving also and doing very creative exhibitions and installations but I think the dollars, I think we could help bring the dollars and connect the dots in a way that hasn't been done yet. It sounds fabulous. And I thank you very much for joining me. I really enjoyed the conversation. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. It was fun to, to talk about. Buildings as branding, buildings to tell stories, buildings to make places. Skylight Studios takes storied and important buildings and reinvents their future quickly while the expensive and permanent redevelopment process churns on in the background. You can find out more about this episode or others you might have missed on the show notes page at our website, rethinkrealestateforgood.co. There's lots to listen to there. A special thanks to David Allardyce for his excellent editing of this podcast and original music. And thanks to you for spending your time with me today. We'll talk again soon, but for now, this is Eve Picker signing off to go make some change.